Hi everyone, thank you very much for, uh, for, for joining us for this talk today. Um, I'm uh, very pleased to be uh, talking about collaborative work and the people who deserve all the credit for this work are on this slide. Uh, Marina is a postdoc at King's College London and she's uh, working with me through the Alan Turing Institute, which is based in the British Library and of course UCL uh, is a key partner in that. Uh, Wilson Chen uh, is now at the University of Sydney. Uh, John Cocaine is also at the Turing Institute. Uh, Pavel and Steve are uh, collaborators from a, a biomechanical engineering and a sort of cardiobiology uh, background. And Lester Mackey is at Microsoft Research in the US, and he is a uh, computational and theoretical statistician. So here's a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about today. The, um, the work is genuinely inspired by a problem that, that came from biology, and that's, um, that's, you know, that's, that's quite unusual because often the, the way these things work is you develop a wonderful computational method and then you, you try and find exemplar problems that really sort of highlight its, its, um, its strengths. But, but this is really the, 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 the way that you normally hear the story told. It's um, problem came first, we developed some methodology and we you know, hopefully made some progress towards solving the problem. So I'm going to start by just describing what that problem was uh, at a very high level. It's going to be very brief, and then we'll get into what the kind of interesting theory and methodology uh, is that we developed. So, uh, as I mentioned just uh, on the collaborators slide, um, Pavel and Steve work in um, biomedical, uh, biomechanical engineering and um, uh, well, essentially computational cardiology. And that covers many different uh, aspects um, of, of modeling and, uh, you know, just fundamental science. Um, and you can kind of characterize these by the scale on which they are um, studied. So at the organ scale, you've got the, the heart. It's um, an organ with clearly defined components that operates in a kind of mechanical way. And within the, the heart, we go down a scale, we've got the tissue scale. Uh, tissue is, um, you know, a collection of interacting cells and the interactions between the cells um, lead to some emergent properties which you know, control things like the heartbeat at the organ level. Uh, and then if we go down the scale again within the cell there's you know, possibly the most complicated um, uh, dynamical system of, of the three. Uh, you've got um, a whole array of molecules which are interacting in incredibly complicated chemical uh, mechanisms that um, regulate uh, what you see at the cell scale. Right, so we've got an incredibly complicated scientific pipeline and of course the um, the reason why people study this apart from out of you know, curiosity is that the very often um, uh, dysregulation of one or more stages in this multi-scale system leads to uh, medical conditions like arrhythmias that are uh, actually very important and you know, there's a huge imperative to try and find treatments for these conditions. What we are interested in in this work is a, a more fundamental biological problem, which is um, if we look at the cell scale and we look at the, you know, the, the, the relative abundances of the different molecules and the, you know, the relative positions in the cell that they find themselves and, and so on, um, do we see much heterogeneity? So do we see heterogeneity between uh, different cells within the same organ or within, um, uh, within different uh, specimens? And um, that's you know, of fundamental interest, but it's also important because there are some hypotheses in um, cardiology that the, um, the, the kind of the, the amount of variation in, um, in, in, get my phrasing right, the amount of variation between cells in the same organ uh, may actually be causally implicated in some of the pathologies that we are trying to you know, ultimately develop treatments for. So um, perhaps as cells get older, uh, they get more dysregulated in various different ways, leading to greater heterogeneity between the cells and the organ, and that can manifest at the organ level by dysregulation of the heartbeat and the electrical activity that drives it. So that's kind of the scientific um, motivation. The statistical problem is, um, is much more um, well-defined, and I'll, I'll, I'll get onto that in a couple of slides. Uh, essentially, we have some data from some number of heart, uh, heart cells, 
Uh, so in this case, we have 25 different heart cells and our biological model here is a, is a rat model. Um, these cells are uh, probed in a way which I'll explain in a second, which leads to data sets. And from these data sets, we hope to investigate whether there are, whether there is evidence for this cell to cell heterogeneity that we're uh, interested in from a scientific perspective. So what's the experiments look like? Um, they're very carefully controlled. So take a, a rat cell, which is represented in the cartoon here. And uh, there, are, there are two things that happen to that cell, um, essentially. Uh, so one is that you can um, hit it with a, an electric stimulus, and the other is that you can hit it with a chemical stimulus. And that cell will respond because that cell is used to being in an environment where it's surrounded by other cells who are signaling in the same way. And the, the reason you get these emergent phenomena of heartbeats is that the, the, the cell interacts with its neighbors to um, cause a, a signaling process to function. So, um, so electricity and chemical signals are applied and chemical here is caffeine, which you know is a very good stimulant of heart cells. And what we can measure is um, the, the, um, essentially the, the amount of calcium that is free uh, floating in the cell. Now why calcium? Um, so you normally think of calcium uh, not in the context of uh, cardiac cells, but actually calcium signaling is a, is a major um, uh, mechanism by which um, regulation of, of cardiac cells um, is occurring. So essentially, the electrical activity, which you're familiar with, which controls the heart beating, causes a cycle of calcium, which is um, essentially uh, released into the cell where it combined with uh, certain proteins leading to the proteins to contract and that manifests at the organ scale as the, the beating. Uh, and then once the, the beat has happened, that um, calcium is released and sequestered back into um, storage compartments in the cell where, uh, where, it, where, it, um, where it's contained until the next cycle. So calcium signaling is actually you know, one of the, the, the key components in um, uh, cardiac regulation. Uh, and we measure calcium as a proxy for what these cells are doing. And uh, hopefully through that proxy measurement of calcium, we'll be able to say something about the cell to cell variability. So if we take 25 cells, expose them to the same electrical and chemical stimuli and observe you know, completely different calcium responses, that speaks to the potential for heterogeneity um, you know, in some aspect of the cellular signaling system. That's, that's what we want to explore. So I said I'd um, make the statistical problem slightly more well defined and uh, I'll do that now. Uh, conceptually, it's uh, very standard actually. So there is a biochemical uh, ordinary differential equation model which describes the calcium regulatory process. I'm not going to attempt to show you what that model looks like. It has 38 parameters. It is a system of six ordinary differential equations uh, and the kind of terms that appear in them for, for those that are interested are the kind of um, michaelis menten and extensions um, that you see in pharmacokinetic models of cellular signaling. But I'm representing them abstractly like this. So theta, theta in this talk is going to denote the parameters of this differential equation model and um, u is going to denote the solution. u is a six-dimensional uh, vector field. Uh, okay, so when we say, is there cell-to-cell -cell variation, we're going to now give meaning to that. We're going to say, do different cells have different values of this, this parameter theta? So that's what we're going to um, study. Uh, and actually, so um, at the very start of this project, uh, Steve Niedero, um, the biomedical engineering expert from King College London, came to me and said, Chris, can you, uh, can you help me? We need to do parameter inference for these differential equation models. We've got 25 cells, you know, we want to know if, there's, if each cell has a, a, a genuinely different parameter value. Uh, and I said, yeah, of course, that's easy. There. The, the idea of doing parameter inference is you know, part of the job description for a statistician. So of course, I'll, I'll do that, it won't take very long. And um, I was naive or just very optimistic. And uh, actually, it was extremely difficult for reasons that I'm going to explain in a second. Um, and the, it, the statistical model itself is not the, um, 
is, is not the, the problem here. So it's, it's very simple. It's a differential equation. And the data are assumed to be related to the differential equation via a Gaussian, an IID, Gaussian measurement error model. So we have time series data. Yi is a measurement of the calcium, uh, the free calcium in the cell at time point indexed by I. And uh, this, um, this, this free calcium corresponds to I'm glossing over some details here, but it corresponds to one component of the differential equation, which is observed. And we assume that uh, there is Gaussian measurement error noise. We know the size of the noise because we have information on the technical measurement resolution of the equipment. So, uh, so the noise bandwidth here, sigma, will be fixed. And, um, and that completely specifies the, uh, the likelihood, or if you prefer, the generative model for the data, given the parameters. Uh, and one, one other side note is we assume the initial condition is known and we, we have reasons why that's a, a reasonable assumption. So this is what it looks like in pictures. So here's the data for one cell, one of the 25 cells. The six panels here correspond to the six different components in the system of differential equations. The black traces corresponds to the uh, the exact solution of a differential equation for a fixed value of the parameter theta. And the red trace here in this panel is the real data. So that's real measurements of uh, free calcium in a cell. And the idea is we've got this theta, which we're allowed to vary. And roughly speaking, we want to find values of theta that are consistent with this red data here. So can we, can we tune theta to get this black curve and in this case lower it slightly so that it is in keeping with the, the red experimental data. Uh, this is an example of an inverse problem. Inverse problems of this kind are very widely studied and you know, uh, in the last five years or so um, people have started to use the name inverse problem or uncertainty quantification in, in, in uh, settings where you have a, a model that's specified by a differential equation although this terminology is very loose. So we want to answer this problem and um, my, my training is pretty much um, exclusively as a Bayesian statistician. I came through um, the University of Warwick which isn't exclusively Bayesian but there's a, a heavy Bayesian presence there and so my in inclination was to address this problem as a, as a Bayesian problem. And how do we do that? Well, we, we already have our generative model for the data given the parameters. What we need in addition is a prior uh, probability distribution that represents the experts um, uh, knowledge about the, the possible values for these parameters theta and um, fortunately we're working with domain experts so getting such expert knowledge is straightforward and a Bayesian of course uh, combines the likelihood with the prior distribution uh, using Bayes rule to obtain a posterior distribution which quantifies our uncertainty about the value of a parameter given the data set. And what we're initially just going to do is to consider a single cell and consider the problem of performing statistical inference for the parameters that govern the calcium signaling system for a single cell. And actually the question of how do you then take um, such, such estimates from 25 different cells and decide if there's a difference or not, that's actually going to be deferred to another talk because that's a whole other story. So this is just going to be a talk about parameter inference for one cell. And um, anyone that's attempted to do Bayesian inference before will be familiar with the, the key uh, computational challenge, which is that to actually um, make use of Bayes' rule, you have to take a quite indirect approach because the denominator, which is the marginal probability of the data that you observed, uh, is a integral which is typically intractable. And the dimension of the integral is the same as the dimension of the parameter, which in this case is 38. And uh, as you would have seen from the previous slide, the data set is quite rich, it's quite informative, and that means that the posterior is going to be supported effectively on a much smaller um, domain compared to the prior. So kind of numerical cubature is, is out the window, really. Um, we're going to need to do uh, something else. And that something else is uh, very commonly Markov chain Monte Carlo. So that's what I'm going to be using as my um, sort of uh, reference computational method. Uh, but a lot of what I say in this talk is not directly um, 
uh, it's not only relevant to Microchain Monte Carlo, but to fix ideas. Let's, let's take Mon Microchain Monte Carlo as the, um, as the canonical computational technique for facilitating Bayesian inferences. And for those who, who don't know, um, the idea of Microchain Monte Carlo is that you can just look at the numerator of this quantity and completely ignore the normalization constant, which was this intractable integral. And using only the numerator, you can construct a Markov chain whose um, time invariant or ergodic distribution coincides with the posterior distribution that, that you're interested in. So by just simply simulating a Markov chain for long enough and looking at the average time that the chain spends in different regions of the parameter space, you can get a consistent approximation of that posterior distribution. Now, um, there are well-known problems that occur when using Microchain Monte Carlo uh, in the context of parameter inference for differential equations. And let me just mention a couple of them. So first of all, depending on the nature of your differential equation, it can happen that the parameters are tightly coupled together. So perhaps those parameters appear as a ratio or a product or something like this. And the data is very informative about the value of the ratio or product. Well, that's going to create essentially like a sub-manifold in the parameter space where parameters on the sub-manifold are consistent with the data um, and those off it are not. Sub-manifolds are challenging because uh, many MCMC methods exploit the fact that um, the, the, post, the, the prior can be kind of used as a reference measure for the posterior. And if you really have a sub manifold, that, that's not the case. Um, here's, a, here's a sort of pictorial represent, representation of that that, um, that I quite like. So uh, what we can do is look at the uh, Fisher information matrix to get an idea of how much information there is in the data. And in doing so, we can try and work out, you know, are we likely to be in a situation where we have a, uh, a posterior that's supported on a subspace or sub manifold of the, the parameter space? Um, if we just look at the Fisher information matrix, that's not particularly useful because we um, uh, the parameters have different physical scales, right? So, um, so we don't want uh, the, the the fact that we've used um, micromoles instead of moles or whatever to have a uh, an impact here. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, look at the prior preconditioned Fisher information matrix, which essentially you know, normalizes out the, the the fact that different parameters have different scales. Uh, and this, this is what we get. So this is uh, very difficult to draw conclusions from because, um, so in this case, there are a couple of the parameters for which the data are really, really, really informative. And uh, that, that sends everything else into this blue mush. So what we're going to do is just normalize out um, in a way that uh, um, removes that effect. And what you can see now are uh, clusters, let's say, of parameters that are, um, well, I, I suppose I should, um, uh, just, just step back a second. So the entries of the Fisher information matrix are a proxy for conditional independence under a, a, a loose Gaussian assumption. So if we see a uh, an off-diagonal entry in this in this uh, normalized prior preconditioned Fisher information matrix, what that means is that the two parameters that are indexed by the row and the column are very tightly related together, roughly speaking. Let me just um, do a thresholding on this matrix so you can more clearly see the clusters that I was referring to. Uh, so if you squint a bit, you can kind of see that there's a, a, a cluster of parameters in the top right, a cluster in the uh, uh, sorry top left, and a cluster in the bottom right. And within those, there's some more parameters that cluster together. Um, this suggests um, that there, there, there may be this issue that, um, uh, that the posture is supported on a sub-manifold if, um, if you use a reasonable threshold and, and you're still seeing blue clusters here. Uh, and actually, the reason why you see this kind of um, block structure is because the experimental protocol that was used, first of all, started by doing, um, I forget which way around, but some kind of electric stimulus and some kind of caffeine stimulus. And the, the parameters of the OD model that are relevant to the electrical and, um, and caffeine responses, um, they're, they're, they're ordered. So in one block, we see the first part of the experimental protocol. And in the second part, we see the, the parameters that are relevant to the second part of the experimental protocol. Okay, so what's another problem with MCMC for ODEs? Um, well, actually, you know, um, you would you would typically expect that MCMC methods that exploit gradient information would mix better. Uh, otherwise, why bother getting gradient information, right? But that's not the case uh, all the time. So, if we are in the situation where the posterior is supported on a submanifold, 
using gradient information is going to push you to take a step toward the, let's say, the center of that submanifold. And in doing so, you can actually just jump straight across it and miss the probability altogether. So moving perpendicular to the manifold is the, you know, it's the hardest direction to move because you, you have the least chance of actually landing on the manifold. So it's known, in fact, that gradient-based methods can be worse than non-gradient-based methods um, when the posterior is very concentrated in this way. And finally, uh, some sense a more trivial point is that you've got to solve these ODEs and you've got to use a numerical method to do that typically. And numerical methods have uh, their associated issues. And it may be that for some values of the parameter, the ODE solver fails either because it doesn't have enough time to get the, um, get the resolution that you've asked for, the error control you've asked for, or just something blows up in, in some way that you couldn't have predicted. And it's unclear whether you can do something about this in the context of MCMC. So the convergence analysis of, analysis of MCMC is not going to um, admit this idea that you, you, know, you just can't solve the, uh, you can't evaluate the likelihood uh, for some values of theta. Typically it will introduce a bias and uh, that's undesirable. And the question is what do you do about that? So we took um, this uh, particular model of calcium thickening which is um, due to someone called Hinch. Uh, and we took our data set for one cell and we ran a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm. Uh, we didn't just run one, we ran a whole host of them. And uh, I'm showing you output from a typical uh, such algorithm. I'm showing you a panel for each of the first 16 parameters and recall that there were 38. So I'm just showing you a snapshot. Each panel is a um, what's called a trace plot. It plots the value taken by the parameter as a function of the number of steps taken by the Markov chain. So recall that if we could take an infinite number of steps, the, um, the average uh, place where these parameters are spending their time is where the, is where the posterior probability mass is. Um, anyone that's used MCMC before will look at these plots and say, well, this is not particularly a nice situation to be in. So we've run uh, I, I guess about 4 million iterations and these do not look to me like they have convincingly converged uh, in the sense that they have um, uh, um, lost the, uh, the knowledge of the initialization which was arbitrary. Uh, this is known as burn-in and there are uh, convergence diagnostics, which can be run to confirm that, in fact, these Markov chains have not been run uh, long enough or have not mixed sufficiently well um, to be reliably considered as um, samples from the, the ergodic limit. So the gelbin rubin convergence diagnostic is an example of one of these diagnostics. And then you're kind of stuck because this particular um, simulation took about two weeks to run on a, um, on a machine that was very high, highly specced. And uh, we, you know, we, we don't have infinite time, so we need to, to draw some scientific conclusions. So we've invested two weeks of um, compute time, not to mention all the time taken to actually get the, the, the coding done. And Gelman and Rubin have told us that we cannot use this output to draw scientific conclusions because it does not pass the criteria uh, that's required to say, yes, this is this is a, uh, a microchain that is mixed. Uh, so that's very unsatisfactory. So how can it be that we spent two weeks running this and we can't draw any scientific conclusions? And that's what motivated us to step back and try and um, think about whether there was something that we could do here. So there must be something that we can do right because we know um, for each state that the microchain visited, we know the, um, the up to a normalization constant, we know the value of the posterior density there. So we actually have learned a lot about the posterior. It's just that we can't literally take the ensemble of states that were visited as an approximate collection of samples on the posterior. So there is information in this picture, it's just not, um, it's not readily um, retrievable for science yet. So that, that's where our methodological contribution is gonna be. We're gonna take something like what's on the screen now and try and draw meaningful conclusions about the posterior um, irrespective of whether the, the market chain is mixed or not. So it sounds like magic, but we'll, we'll see how that actually shapes up. <laughs>
So this is kind of um, a conceptual picture of what we'd like to do. So suppose that our posterior is this object on the left. So I'm, I'm drawing this in two dimensions because it's just a cartoon. Uh, this, this posterior has uh, two Gaussian components. And we're going to initialize the Markov chain in the top left corner, and it's going to run for a finite period of time, and then we're going to stop it. So that's this middle picture here. And in that finite amount of time, which we're going to take as a Cartesian representation of our two-week computational budget, it's managed to, uh, so it starts in the bottom left um, component, it moves around for a while, it then eventually crosses into the top right component, and it stays there for less time, and then the simulation ends. So th this is not an example of a Markov chain that you would want to uh, say has mixed because it clearly spent more time in this component than this component. But nevertheless, there's information in this about this, this posterior. So we should be able to, to say something. And what we're going to attempt to do is to look at the MCMC output and extract from that a collection of states which are represented by these red dots in the right-hand panel, such that those states together um, are a a good, let's say, and I'll make that precise later, approximation of the posterior. So we're going to aim to get as many red dots in this uh, top right component as compared to the top, uh, the bottom left component. And we're going to want to not select any states from this part of the trajectory, which is clearly the, the burn in part of the trajectory. And we need to do all of this in a way which um, uh, circumvents needing to to evaluate that normalization constant, which was that 38 dimensional integral. That's, that's, the, I, that's, that's the goal, and we'll see how we can do that. If we could do that, it'd be fantastic though, because you could run um, an MCMC method, forget about convergence diagnostics, and just attempt to, um, to salvage information from, uh, from, from whatever output you get. Um, so it's clearly a desirable thing to, to do, but. Uh, can we do it? Uh, the, the, the other thing that we're kind of implicitly going to try and do is compress the MCMC output. So in this case, by just taking a subset of the states, the red dots, um, we've also got a compressed representation of the posterior. Now, as a generic computational tool, you may not want to compress your representation. That, that may not be a, an issue. Uh, but in our motivating context of cardiac modeling, it turns out that compression is really important because what we're going to want to do is once we've established um, what we know about the parameters in a cell, we're going to want to say, you know, um, how, how does this actually manifest on the organ level? Does the variation that we may or may not have found between parameters between cells and so on, does that lead to relevant um, physiological um, uh, variation between, between people? So we're going to need to ultimately um, instantiate values of the parameters and then perform a whole organ simulation of a heart to work out what effect those parameter values had on the, on the, the, the heartbeat. And that's gonna require um, multi-scale, multi-everything, multi-level, um, multi-physics um, simulations, which are computationally very expensive. So by having a way to compress the representation of our uncertainty about um, the parameters that control the calcium signaling within a cell, that's actually going to buy us something in the future. It's going to reduce the number of calls to the organ scale model that we need to, to make. Right, that's the, um, that's the high level picture. Let's get into the, the details. Here's what we need to do. We need to find a subset of uh, the, the states theta i visited by the Markov chain, such that the empirical measure that's um, a uniformly weighted measure supported on that subset is in some sense minimizing the difference between uh, itself and the posterior that we'd like to approximate. So this is abstractly what we would like to do. And the first obvious remarks are, you know, well, this sounds great, but you don't know the posterior, so how can you have a a way of you know, quantifying the, the difference between the posterior and the empirical measure when you don't know the posterior. The uh, second remark you probably make is, well, you know, you've just written argmin over sets of size m, and that's a that's a combinational, sorry, um, combinatorial optimization problem, and it's probably very hard as well. And just you know, just a remark. 
we don't need to consider uniformly weighted empirical approximations, but it's convenient because I can draw red dots and you know what that means. So let's, let's just do that for this talk. So we're gonna, we're gonna go off on two methodological tangents now to address these remarks. The first tangent we're gonna go off on is, uh, is in order, uh, it will allow us to develop a computational, um, sorry, a computable measure of difference between an empirical measure and the posterior. So we're going to develop something to take the place of this, this difference measure here that is computable even without the normalization constant in close form. And then the second thing that we're going to do is going to address this challenge here, the combinata combinatorial optimization challenge. Uh, and just to spoil uh, the story, um, we're, we're not going to actually address the full combinatorial problem, we're going to instantiate a greedy algorithm instead. Right, so let's address this first problem. We need a way of measuring the difference between an empirical measure and a posterior that doesn't require us to, to really you know, know the posterior. The tool that's going to allow us to do that uh, is, well, there are two tools. Uh, the first is something called a reproducing kernel, and we'll get on to the second tool in a second. A reproducing kernel is a symmetric positive definite function um, that takes uh, arguments from the parameter space and returns a real number. And to a kernel, we associate a Hilbert space of functions, and that Hilbert space is defined um, in the following way. It contains translates of the kernel, and for any function in this Hilbert space, the inner product of that function with the kernel uh, has the effect of evaluating that function. So that, that's where the, the terminology comes from. The kernel reproduces function values by taking the inner product of the function with the kernel. Now, why am I talking about reproducing kernels? It's because it's going to make us, um, uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna allow us to, um, to come up with a meaningful measure of, of, of difference. So let's define our measure of difference to be the following. So it's going to be, we're gonna look at the difference between an empirical average value of a function compared to its actual average, where average here refers to um, posterior expectation. And we're going to look at this error and we're going to choose a function f adversarially within the unit board of a reproducing kernel Hilbert space to maximize this error. And this quantity here is going to be our measure of difference. You may recognize this as something called an integral probability metric. And uh, it's just, um, just rewrite that slightly. So, so we have the reproducing property here, the kernel reproduces function values. We can literally just replace function value by, by the inner product of the function of the kernel, which I do here. And once we've done that, we can exploit the linearity of the inner product, which is a standard property of inner products, um, to, to obtain the following expression. And once we've got to this point, we're, we're very nearly done now, um, we, we realize that from the familiar cauchy schwartz inequality, um, we can actually uh, evaluate this. So we, we're, gonna, we're gonna be able to evaluate this supremum, and it's gonna occur when f is basically parallel to the, the argument here. So here's the, here's the supremum in closed form. It's the RKHS norm of the average of the kernel, uh, the empirical average compared to the actual average. And these, these, these quantities are recognized as kernel mean embeddings for those who are familiar with um, that terminology. We're just gonna give that a, a convenient notation. So this thing here uh, is quantifying how well the point set theta i is representing, sorry, how well the, the, the set of these theta i's is representing the posterior p. Um, two, two challenges still remain. We don't know p, so we can't compute this integral. And typically for reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces, you can't evaluate RKHS norms in closed form either. So we're a bit stuck. So let's, um, let's deal with the second problem. We need to evaluate this RKHS norm. Now it turns out we're actually in luck here because um, there's a trick. So we can expand that norm squared as an inner product, use linearity of the inner product again, and then use the reproducing property to get a closed form expression. And if that was too quick, then um, uh, I guess you can pause the, the slides on YouTube to see how that, how that worked. So what we end up having to do is to evaluate the kernel, which is fine, and compute these two quantities. And these quantities are the, the mean embedding of the kernel and the integral of the mean embedding. And, and this is still a problem because 
these two quantities require us to perform integrals with respect to the posterior and we don't know the posterior. So we've not really made progress yet. What we have done is um, you know, identified a measure of difference which we think is interesting, but it's still not computable. So that's going to um, motivate a, uh, a, a, another slight digression into um, Charles Stein's famous method for approximating probability distributions. So this was um, a method that was presented in a 1972 paper. And his goal in that paper was to try and come up with a central limit theorem for correlated variables. So we know that the, the target of this central limit theorem is going to be a Gaussian. Uh, but the approximating distribution is going to be very complicated. You know, it's the sum of correlated random variables. So he, he needed a way of measuring the difference between that Gaussian, the central limit limiting Gaussian, and this complicated sum of correlated random variables. And Stein's method, which we're going to see now, is, um, is how he did that. So it turns out you can characterize many probability distributions in terms of a pair consisting of something called a, a Stein operator and something called a Stein class. And the characterization works as follows. So a random variable theta is distributed according to the distribution P, if and only if the expected value of all functions of the form Stein operator applied to function in this Stein class is zero. Now that's very abstract, of course, so let's get straight into an example. So suppose P is a Gaussian distribution. It turns out I can take a particular differential operator, uh, which looks like this. So what we do is we, we multiply uh, a function by the PDF of the Gaussian, take the derivative of that product and divide by the PDF of the Gaussian. And the function class is basically uh, in, in, in enough functions that um, this characterization is, is measured determining. Okay, we're gonna see this operator again. So just, just remember that. Um, we are interested in studying um, uh, distributions, uh, posterior distributions that are not Gaussian. So we're going to need to take that kind of idea from Stein's method, but develop Stein characterizations for di distributions that are not necessarily Gaussian. And it turns out there's a general recipe to do this, which I'm going to present in one dimension for simplicity. So we can take our reproducing kernel and under regularity assumptions, it turns out that a Stein characterization of a general distribution P uh, is given by the following Stein operator and Stein class. So the Stein operator is exactly the one on the previous slide that worked for the Gaussian. And all we do is we take the Stein class to be um, the unit board of the RKHS. So this is a really generic recipe. The only thing, uh, the, the only way that the, the distribution you're trying to characterize enters into the characterization is through its PDF P in the Stein operator. And crucially, that PDF P enters on the numerator and the denominator. So if you didn't have that PDF of the posterior up to a normalization constant, that's not going to stop you from evaluating the Stein operator, which means you always have access to the Stein characterization of your posterior distribution, assuming you can evaluate the, the unnormalized posterior PDF, which is what we're assuming in this talk. Okay, so how are we going to use this Stein characterization? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to um, uh, we're going to take I'm just going to scroll back here. We're going to take our set of functions that was used to define this supremum very early on. We're going to take that set of functions to be a set of functions that we know is going to integrate to zero. And in doing so, that's going to solve this problem of not having access to the kernel embedding and its integral, because both of these quantities will have to be zero. So how do we do that? Well, we look at the Stein characterization and we say, well, once we've got our Stein operator and our Stein class, we know that the integral of all the functions in that Stein class is going to be zero. And we know that those, those functions are measure determining. So if we apply the Stein operator to elements of our reproducing kernel helper space, we obtain another reproducing kernel helper space whose kernel has this form. And again, you see, whenever the posterior density appears, it appears in a ratio, meaning that we can, we can evaluate this kernel uh, without knowledge of the normalization constant of the posterior. And by construction, those two problematic terms, uh, which kind of required we had access to the posterior to evaluate, they're now exactly zero. Okay, so these are the building blocks, and we're going to put them together. Um, we're going to put them together now. Here's just a picture of what we built 
for, for, for anyone that's not quite followed that. We've taken elements of the generic we've used in kernel Hilbert space. We've applied a Stein operator, which is specific to the posterior distribution we want to approximate. And we've obtained three new functions. So the solid curve here corresponds to the solid curve here. Uh, and all that's happened is we've applied a Stein operator, which characterized this distribution here. So this is a cartoon, and but this is, this is representing the posterior distribution in our cartoon. Now, by construction, all of these functions are going to integrate to zero under the posterior. And that's, that's a really interesting property because we didn't know the posterior, and yet we've been able to, to ensure that these functions integrate to zero with respect to the posterior. Okay, so how are we going to use this? We're going to substitute these functions that integrate to zero into our measure of difference, and that's going to eliminate the problematic terms that we can evaluate, leaving only evaluation of this k0 kernel, which we previously saw and can be evaluated. This is called kernel Stein discrepancy, and it's been studied by um, uh, several authors now, uh, but it was introduced in 2016. The reason people study Stein discrepancy is that not only is it computable, which is obviously important, but because of all the theory that Charles Stein and, and subsequent authors have done, um, we actually know that's a characterization. So with enough theoretical effort, and it's non-trivial, you can show that convergence in kernel Stein discrepancy actually applies weak convergence of the empirical measure to the posterior using um, this, this the, you know, the power of the Stein characterization. So here's, here's the high level result. So if your empirical distribution converges to the posterior distribution in a standard notion of convergence called Wasserstein, it follows that the kernel Stein discrepancy of that empirical measure of the posterior converges as well. And convergence of the kernel Stein discrepancy implies convergence of, uh, so this is the Dudley metric, but this is, um, this is metrizing weak convergence. So this is what I just said. If, the, if the, the kernel Stein discrepancy between the empirical measure and the target converges to zero, the measure converges weakly to the posterior. So that would be a consistent approximation of the posterior. So we're there. So, so what, I, what I started out by saying was we, we have to solve two challenges. We have to approximate, um, we have to come up with a, a, a measure of the approximation quality or the difference between the empirical measure and the target that is computable. And then we have to solve a combinatorial optimization problem. We're going to solve the combinatorial optimization problem using a greedy algorithm. So we're not going to attempt to solve it at all. Essentially, we're going to cop out. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to choose points, we're going to choose red dots in that picture, such that um, we greedily minimize the kernel Stein discrepancy between the empirical measure that we obtain by adding a new point and the posterior. Uh, and that, that's all it is. So it's an incredibly simple algorithm, which amounts to just sequentially uh, scanning through your MCMC output and seeing which value, if I add it to my current set, will minimize this quantity. It, it has uh, pretty low computational complexity. So to add one point, you scan through all your MCMC samples and compute this quantity at cost m squared, where m is the number of samples you've currently got. Uh, so it's, it's uh, linear in the number of MCMC samples, quadratic in the number of samples that you'd like to add. So let's see how it works. So in fact, that picture I showed you before, that was exactly um, an application of this, this algorithm, which we call Stein thinning, to this MCMC output. Uh, so these red points are chosen automatically by minimizing in a greedy fashion the kernel Stein discrepancy between the corresponding empirical measure and the posterior. If we plot the log of the kernel Stein discrepancy, uh, which is this red curve here, you see it's, it's uniformly better than the kernel Stein discrepancy that's formed by the, um, the empirical measure that's, that's um, corresponding to the, the MCMC output, the, the, the partial sum essentially of Dirac. Okay, so in five minutes, I'm just going to very quickly scan over the kind of theoretical results that you can produce with this method because these are somewhat technical and of, 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 of more, more um, specialist interest. But what we can show is that if we have a fixed set of points, so that corresponds to running a Markov chain once and just, just treating that output as a fixed set, then by greedily selecting points in this fashion, we can minimize kernel Stein discrepancy at a rate which is um, essentially one over the square root of the, uh, the, the number of points you've picked. And the minimum value will be the optimally weighted empirical measure that you can possibly build on that set of points. Okay, so that's, that's nice. But what we're really interested in is 
what if I apply this to the output of NCMC and how does the randomness from the NCMC output interact with this greedy algorithm to choose a subset of states from that output? And this is the kind of result that we have. So we have to stylize this somehow. So let's just make some assumptions on what the MCMC algorithm was. Let's assume it's a kind of a canonical MCMC method. So it obviously leaves the posterior invariant. It's time homogenous and it's reversible. Uh, we're going to assume V uniform ergodicity, which is to say uh, there is a function uh, V such that um, if a Markov chain starts uh, in the distance somewhere, um, the speed with which it returns to the support of the distribution is, is in some sense described by V. I'm avoiding the technical definition of the uniform ergodicity, but for the, for the experts, this is the, uh, the, the regularity assumption on the Markov chain. I'm going to assume a couple of moment conditions, which I'm not going to attempt to describe, but are, are, are pretty weak. And then we have a result which is as follows. So the expected squared kernel Stein discrepancy between the empirical measure that we get by thinning a, uh, an instance of a Markov chain uh, enjoys this finite sample size error bound. So we've got a term that depends on how long we ran the Markov chain for, and a term that depends on how many states we selected uh, from that Markov chain output. And by balancing m with n, you can, of course, get an optimal uh, 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 version of this bound. Just a couple of quick remarks. So this is a little bit mysterious because um, these quantities have appeared in the moment conditions. This is the square root of the k0 kernel. And if you haven't quite kept track of where that comes from and what that means, the k0 um, kernel on the diagonal amounts to something which is very closely related to the, uh, the, the norm squared of the gradient of the, the log posterior. Um, and that, that happens, that identification happens when the kernel is translation invariant. So you can replace the square root of the k0 theta thetas here with the gradient of uh, the, the norm of the gradient of the log posterior density, uh, in which case everything becomes relatively standard. So what we'd want to do here is to uh, is to take m approximately proportional to n to minimize this bound. Uh, and if we want compression, we could take m to be, for example, one thousandth of the n CMC output. So in our application, we had you know, four million uh, points. Let's select four thousand of them, and that would uh, you know, approximately minimize this this upper bound. Um, so I, I, I heavily sold this idea that you don't need your MCMC to, to converge or to satisfy standard convergence diagnostics to use this method. And I want to try and provide some theoretical support for that because that's a, you know, an outlandish claim. It's not clear how to stylize this, right? So what does it mean for an MCMC not to mix? So I've got to, I've got to, I've got to impose some style on, on how we present this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that the Markov chain has sampled from a distribution which is not p. Okay, so that's one way of studying theoretically the, the, the effect of not mixing. And that is kind of a reasonable thing to do, I think. So let's, let's do this. So suppose the Markov chain satisfies all the properties that we talked about before, but actually targets the wrong distribution. So let's say it targets q instead of p. Now, provided that p is absolutely con continuous with respect to q, so that at least you know, the, the Markov chain stands a chance of, of visiting the, the relevant regions for P, uh, then we can, we can still obtain a um, consistency result for Stein thinning. So what we do is we, uh, we, we, we modify our assumptions very slightly. So now the, the radon nicodym derivative of, of, of P over Q appears in these expressions. And you know, this object's gonna be big if P and Q are very different and otherwise it's gonna be controlled in some way if P is somewhat similar to Q. And the kind of conclusion that we can draw is actually quite strong. So we can say that um, almost surely with respect to instances of the Markov chain sample path, the empirical measure that we get by selecting m states from the output of that sample path converges in, in the standard weak sense to the posterior. And this happens um, under very weak assumptions on how m and n are related. So we, we need to select less than all of the points from the Markov chain and the Markov chain can grow potentially very, very quickly with respect to, to M. So there's, there's, no, there's no constraints here, essentially. So this is nice. And although this is, you know, this is stylized, um, I think this is quite strong theoretical support for the idea that you can run a Markov chain that may not have worked to your satisfaction, but provided that it's at least you know, visited the relevant regions of the state space once, 
you stand a very good chance of being able to retrospectively thin the output of that Markov chain in order to get a very accurate approximation of the distribution that you intended to approximate. And that makes sense, right? Because in our cartoon, the Markov chain had explored both components of that Gaussian mixture model quite thoroughly. It just hadn't quite you know, had the time to average the right number of samples over the right number of components and to forget about the burn in sufficiently. But all the information was there if we could have just, just extracted the relevant part of it. And this theorem supports the idea that we can actually do that. Uh, I don't have time for empirical results because I want to keep it within one hour, but here are um, features which demonstrate similar behavior to what we saw in the cartoon, but on real examples. Um, we have to specify the reproducing kernel, and typically these kernels come with parameters that one should either uh, attempt to estimate or should have some heuristic way of setting. And we explore in quite some detail the effect of these heuristics on the performance of the method uh, with, uh, with recommendations which will be um, explained in detail in the paper that I'll give the reference to in a moment. Broadly speaking, we obtain, uh, say, an order of, order of um, magnitude a lower error for parameter uh, posterior mean approximation uh, on a standard um, uh, model for um, these, uh, these cellular um, regulatory processes called the Goodwin oscillator. We achieve smaller um, uh, error in terms of the, the, the full empirical distribution as approximation posterior as quantified by the energy distance which is an objective measure of performance that we are not directly minimizing in our method. If we look at the kernel standard discrepancy, which we are uh, explicitly minimizing, of course, we, we have very nice results, um, uh, which you would hope to see. Uh, we we uh, replied this to the 38-dimensional um, calcium model, and this is what we got, and this is work in progress, so I'm, I'm not gonna draw too many conclusions yet, but, what seems to happen is that by thinning the output from this MCNC, which hasn't mixed, you get uh, substantially lower values of kernel Stein discrepancy. And what I'm going to conjecture is that um, what we're seeing here is, is quite substantial bias correction. So it's likely that only the, the, the last part of the Markov chain um, is scientifically relevant compared to the, the, the first part. Um, so if we did something naive, for example, if we, if we did what is often done, which is you kind of you know, ignore the first, let's say, half of the Markov chain and then thin the rest by taking um, states from uniform time steps along the sample path, uh, you, achieve, you achieve kernel sign discrepancy, which is an order of magnitude higher. And I suspect that's because um, uh, the, 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 the bias from the burning period is is quite substantial in this sample path. And um, by using kernel Stein discrepancy, we can perform that bias correction, but by doing standard thinning methods, or even this method called support points by um, Simon Mack and Roshan Joseph, um, you're not able to perform that bias correction. We think that's what's going on. But further detail is, uh, further in, in empirical investigation is needed to really understand this due to the, the complicated nature of the model and the, the high dimensionality and so on. So let me wrap up. So to summarize, um, Parameter inference is hard, uh, and uh, um, I should have, uh, yeah, perhaps been a little bit more um, uh, appreciative of that fact before jumping into this project. But nevertheless, we have got somewhere. We have got MCMC, which um, which mixes to a limited extent, not enough to satisfy the traditional convergence diagnostics, but enough for us to be able to extract science, uh, to draw scientific conclusions from a partial sample path. Now that's going to work if the Markov chain has at least explored the relevant areas of the parameter space once. Now it may not have done, in which case I'm not sure we can solve that problem. But if it explores it at least once, then we've got a very strong chance of being able to select that relevant portion of the sample path using greedy minimization of kernel Stein discrepancy. And that can perform bias correction and lead to a consistent approximation of posterior quantities of interest. So if you found that um, at all interesting or, or you have um, uh, further, further questions, um, do please either ask them now or contact me by email or take a look at the, uh, the report of this work, which is on the archive and it's called Optimal Thinning of MCMC Output. Uh, thank you all very much for your attention. <laughs>